Woo. that the Eternal has conquered for the community of Israel is cattle country, and your servants have cattle. They're Texans. <laughs> it would be to us. Yeah, <laughs> cowboys in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> Israel, I'm 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 Everlasting love you offered your people Israel by teaching us Torah and mitzvot, laws and precepts. Therefore, Adonai our God, when we lie down, when we rise up, we will meditate on your laws and your commandments. We will rejoice in your Torah forever. Day and night we will reflect on them, for they are our life, and doing them lengthens our days. Never remove your love from us. Praise to you, Adonai, who loves your people, Israel. Brilliant, Gary, as always. Mwah. Well, there's a little mistake in there, but you might have not noticed it. This is a, this is actually a pretty big Torah portion this week, right? It's it's double. It's double. Uh, yeah, I see. I see Mike, Doctor Mike, saying yes. Yeah, we have Matot Masse. Yes. Yeah, so. Last two chapters, the last two portions of Bamidbar, the Book of Numbers. Okay. Do, do you guys do you guys know why it's a double portion this week? I don't know. The reason is, is that we want to finish the book of Numbers before Tisha B'Av. Ah. What is the reason why they would want to finish before Tisha B'Av? Well, be, uh, because once we, um, once it is, the temple was destroyed, um, there was a huge period of mourning, and back then, they did not read the Torah to anybody. Oh, this really? is back then. Oh. So remember, just, this is this is biblical time. This is pre-Zoom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I really wouldn't have known that. <laughs> okay, so you you, you remember that uh, you know one of the things that they used to do when the temple was there is that every week they would actually read the Torah to the people so everybody could hear it because you know. Oh. No, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. So that was something new I've learned tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful to have Dr. Mike with yes. us on this Torah study. This is great. Yes. yes. Does anyone want to start with the summary? Like Moses explains? Is that where you want to start? Yes. yes. Okay, I'll start. Moses explains to the Israelites the laws concerning vows made by men and women. Israel wages war against the Midianites. The laws regarding the spoils of war are outlined. You can read the numbers. The tribes of Reuben and God are granted permission to stay on the east bank of the Jordan River. The itinerary of the Israelites through the wilderness from Egypt to Jordan is delineated. And that's in what, 33, one through 49? Moses tells Israel to remove the current inhabitants of the land that God will give them and to destroy their gods. The boundaries of the land of Israel are defined along with those of the Levitical cities and the cities of refuge. Oh, two more. 
God makes a precise distinction between murder and manslaughter. That's very interesting. Yes, there is a difference. Seriously, Seriously what's the difference? We'll Intent. Yeah. Intent. All right, the laws of inheritance as they apply to Israelite women are delineated. All right, does anyone want to start with um, the book of Numbers, verse 2, Moses? Hmm. I'll do it. Okay. Moses spoke to the heads of the Israelite tribe, saying, This is what the Eternal has commanded. If a householder makes a vow to the Eternal or takes an oath imposing an obligation on himself, he shall not break his pledge. He must carry out all that has crossed his lips. If a woman, this is where it gets a little bit discriminatory. If a woman <laughs> makes a vow to the eternal or assumes an obligation while still in her father's household by reason of her youth and her father learns of her vow or her self-imposed obligation and offers no objection. Can you please bring it up? Thank you. Oops, not too far. Okay. All her vows shall stand and every self-imposed obligation shall stand. But if her father restrains her on the day he finds out, none of her vows or self-imposed obligations shall stand, and the Eternal will forgive her since her father restrained her. So what I want to understand, is it only done with the woman or the sons as well? Because it's saying if the woman was still in her father's house, what if the son was still in the father's house? Okay, I, I, can, I can take a crack at that. Okay. As far as the women were concerned, or you know, the daughters, they yeah. were considered to be property of the father. Mm, okay. The All men, right. the, the, the boy, the men were not. I got it. Okay. All right. I'll continue reading because I'm aggravated. Okay. aggravated <laughs> too. <laughs> <laughs> if she would marry while her, well, I'm sorry. If she should marry while her vow or the commitment to which she bound herself is still in force and her husband learns of it and offers no objection on the day he finds out, her vow shall stand and her self-imposed obligations shall stand. But if her husband restrains her on the day that he learns of it, he thereby annuls her vow, which was in force um, or the commitment to which she bound herself and the eternal will forgive her. The vow of a widow or a divorced woman, however, whatever she has imposed on herself shall be binding upon her. That's really upsetting to me. I really want to understand that more. So too, if while in her husband's household, she makes a vow or imposes her obligation on herself by oath, and her husband learns of it, yet offers no objection, thus failing to restrain her, all her vows shall stand and all her self-imposed obligations shall stand. But if her husband does annul them on the day he finds out, then nothing that has crossed her lips shall stand. Whether vows of self-imposed obligations, her husband has annulled them, and the eternal will forgive her. Every vow and every sworn obligation of self-denial may be upheld by her husband or annulled by her husband. If her, please yeah, go up. Yeah. Thank you. I'm ready if, for, okay, go ahead. Oh, oh, he went up too good. If her husband offers no objection from that day to the next, he was upheld all the vows or obligations she has assumed. He was upheld then by offering no objection on the day he found out. But if he annuls them after the day he founds out, he shall bear her guilt. Oh, good. I'm glad something happens for you. Is, is, anyone, <laughs> thinking, is anyone thinking of the... Um, uh, the fiddler on the roof right now. <laughs> <laughs> you gave each other. Who a asks life? you? <laughs> I'm the father. What I can't understand is what kind of vows would somebody make that would be contradictory to her, her husband or her family life. I mean, I don't understand. But they didn't mention what they were. They no, know. but it has to have been pretty serious. You okay. know. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I can answer one. Okay, okay, go. A vow of marriage. If the daughter wants to marry somebody that was not acceptable to the father, the father could say, no, you cannot marry that person. Okay, but to take it one step further. What if they were married and she thinks he's a, <laughs> she has a lot of words for him, so she doesn't tell him what she's going to say, and she says it, and then he doesn't like it, then he can annul it. Is that it? Because oh, I don't oh, want it to happen. 
okay, all of this would have happened while his daughter was still in the family unit. Once she got married, she was out of the father's will. So then it was the husband who had the final word. Right, right. I told you it was a little bit discriminatory. <laughs> no, I don't think it's a little. I think it's a lot. A lot. <laughs> Women were treated like chattels, and that is very annoying. Okay, but don't forget, this goes back 3,000 years. That's great. No Thank you, excuses. Dr. Mike. No excuses. <laughs> That's why, you know, and we, let's not get into cancel culture, right? I mean, we, gotta, we know this is... And they, these these things, I mean, granted, I think things have changed. Times have changed, you know. Tradition. <laughs> but you know, I want to If away. I say but you I will, to, you I will. Mention something that's really quite apropos for today. Just think about it. You just said three thousand years ago. Okay, that's the way it was then. But you know, the blacks are saying that a lot of those statues are going down because of what happened to them when they were slaves and how they were treated. So I think it's actually quite interesting that there are people that don't feel that it's important now to do that because they want to, they want to revere the history, even though it wasn't a great history. So I think that's really interesting because there's a, there is somewhat of a parallel to that, if you think about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. Um, can we carry on then? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Cynthia, that's okay. It's a lot. We got a double portion, guys. We got a. Uh, yeah, how about Cynthia? Single portion. Can you hear me all right? Am I muted or not? No, you're good. You're good. Okay. We hear you. Beautiful. Those are the laws the eternal enjoined upon Moses between a husband and his wife, and as between a father and his daughter while in her father's household by reason of her youth. The eternal one spoke to Moses, saying, Avenge the Israelite people on the Midianites. Then you shall be gathered to your kin. Moses spoke to the militia, saying, Let troops be picked out from among you for a campaign, and let them fall upon Midian to wreak the eternal's vengeance on Midian. You shall dispatch on the campaign a thousand from every one of the tribes of Israel. There's an awful lot of people out there. Yeah. So a thousand from each tribe were furnished from the divisions of Israel, 12,000 picked for the campaign. Moses dispatched them on the campaign a thousand from each tribe, with Phineas, son of Eliezer, serving as a priest on the campaign, equipped with the sacred, you have to move this. Yeah. Oops, there it is, sacred utensils. Okay. Uh, oh. oh, equipped with the sacred utensils and the trumpet for sounding the blasts. They took, they took the field against Midian as the Eternal had commanded Moses and slew every male. Along with their other victims, they slew the kings of Midian, Evi, Rechem, Zura, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also put Balaam, son of Beor, to the sword. The Israelites took the women and other combatants of the Midianites captive and seized as booty all their beasts and all their herds and all their wealth. You know, these were not Sadakim, I'm telling you. <laughs> and they destroyed by fire all the towns in which they were settled and their encampments. They gathered all the spoil and all the booty, human and beast. And they brought the captives, the booty and the spoil to Moses, Eliezer the priest, and the whole Israelite community at the camp in the steppes of Moab at the Jordan near Jericho. Moses, Eliezer the priest, and all the, the community came out to meet them outside the camp. Moses became angry with the commanders of the army, the officers of thousands and the hundreds of thousands, officers of hundreds who had come back from the military campaign. Moses said to them, you have spared every female. Okay. okay. <laughs> Yet they are the very ones who at the bidding of Balaam induced the Israelites to trespass against the eternal in the matter of Peor so that the Eternal's community was struck by the plague. Now therefore slay every meal among the dependents and slay also every woman who has known a man kindly, but spare every female dependent who has not had carnal relations with a man. You shall then stay outside the camp seven days, every one among you or among your captives who has slain a person or touched a corpse shall purify himself on the third and seventh days. You shall also purify every cloth, every article of skin, 
everything made of goats here and every object of wood. Elias the priest said to the troops who had taken part in the fighting, this is the ritual law that the Eternal has enjoined upon Moses, gold and silver, copper, iron, tin, and lead. Any article that can withstand fire, these shall you pass through fire, and they shall be pure, except that they must be purified with water of lustration. Oops. Okay. And anything that cannot withstand fire, you must pass through water. On the seventh day, you shall wash your clothes and be pure, and after that, you may enter the camp. Okay. The can, we one said, can we stop for a second? What mm -hmm. What does everyone think of this? I mean, it is pretty harsh, I'd say. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy. <clears throat> you know what? You know what's interesting? Um, I think part of it is um, because in both in these parshas, we also get into the um, the idea of sanctuary cities and the difference between murder and manslaughter. And I, like I said, intention. And the Torah, um, the Torah specifies, like if you take like a stone to, you know, shed somebody's blood with malice, like you should be put to death. But there were also the sanctuary cities, as we'll read, that were set up in case somebody accidentally, and, you know, I won't get into all the details of that now. But even here, when like now Moses is upset he's almost telling them you didn't kill enough yeah you killed all the you know you still have you still got some killing left to do mm. but you know it's like i'm just saying you know not that i'm you know they were ordered by god like god told them to do it and then you know he ordered them to do it you know the people that were able to fight but also in the torah after they fight moses tells them like that they're supposed to stay outside the camp like for a week if they've killed Anybody or I had touched a corpse mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they're supposed to not be able to enter without sin. So it's almost like, you know, it's pointing out almost like as gruesome and harsh as it seems, but it's pointing out like the difference between like murdering somebody. In this case, it's like they're killing, but they're doing it like in battle. You know, they're doing it because God ordered them to. They're not doing it like because they're psychotic serial killers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a methodic you know, think, killing. It's a methodic killing, is what I. Yeah, but I, I but I think I think it's pointing out like you know, it, it, but I think it's it, it shows the difference between. I think it helps like show the difference between murder, and manslaughter. Right. You know, I mean, like not every not every killing is murder. Right. You know. But also, I think, too, um, one of the things that I often think about, because it's harsh for me to think about, wow, God is really getting it in there, and, and he's laying, uh, he's, he's setting aside some, somebody's customs, I feel like. And I, I, if we go back to the, the, I mean, there's some history here when he talks about Balaam and how uh, Balaam kind of... Um, uh, goaded the Midianite women to to interact with the with the Israelite men and and it was really about um, idol worship. It was really about false god worship as well as the the inter you know the sexual relations. Um, and I think that I think that idol worship is really a key component to all of this um, violence, if if you will, because. Um, it's really important, and I and I say that from my own Christian perspective because if there, there, and we don't really get it until we get into Deuteronomy when Moses he lays clear why this uh, pagan idol worship is so bad, and it's because they were actually sacrificing children to their gods, and um, and that that is something that I can somewhat understand a little bit from from our modern day perspective where. God does not want that tradition from these pagans to actually be part of anything that he wants going forward. So when he says eliminate everything, he's really meaning bring every, in my mind, this is just my opinion. We're all just saying our opinions here. It means to me that it just means we, they cannot, no one can even have a, re, a memory of what was going on back then. That's how, that's how bad I believe it, pro, it must have been. Um, so anyway, but today we're we're all modern and we're all hey together. Uh, just my opinion. I see a lot of people like. Hmm? <laughs> Interesting because um, this is almost like wholesale slaughter. 
And in our world today, it happens, but it happens under different circumstances. Like I'm thinking of 9-11. Yep. An awful lot of people were killed en masse. And there have been other things like this, wars, um, the Holocaust. Yeah. And you say to yourself, is this our modern way of killing a large group of people off? Yep. Or, you know, in, in other words, does God have a different way of doing it? And now you begin to wonder, is the coronavirus part of this? In other words, if we want to get rid of a lot of people at one time, we don't go and kill them individually. We just bring a plague or something and everybody dies. Yeah, but we don't, uh, the, the plague uh, isn't, isn't, well, maybe it was created by man by accident in the lab. There are some theories, but this is, it, people aren't willing this to happen, but this other stuff, they're, doing it on their own. I mean, man is a terrible animal. Mm -hmm. Okay. But man is very cruel to man and we blame it on God. We say God said to do it in this time. Now we just do it. So would this be like the Armenian genocide by the Turks? Yes. Yep. Okay, so, so, Rwanda. Yes. Yeah, so, well, if you go back, if you go back to the Armenian uh, genocide, that was in 1911, 1912. And then the other one, of course, it was in the 70s and 80s. So, yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Anyone care to <laughs> pick it up at the... Well, the but the difference is, wait, the whole difference is, though, is that the people that he's talking about in the Bible right now did things to, 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 to get themselves killed. Like, they were doing all this carnal stuff, you know, where they were having sex with everybody else. So it was it was a reason for it. But when somebody just gets rid of a whole bunch of people, like the Holocaust or the Median uh, genocide, that wasn't because the people were bad. See, that's really careful. You have to be careful how you say that. I don't like the idea of you just say you have to, you know, that they had to cleanse people because there was nothing wrong with these Armenians. Right. And but I in this particular, I was going to say, in this particular thing, I'm just saying, like, if you accept like what's in the Torah, but in the in the Torah. You know, God tells Moses that this has to be done, and then Moses. You know what I mean? Right. So it still comes. It still comes back to like, it, it, as tough as it is, what they're doing here, all that killing. Right. But they were based on what the Torah says. God told them to do this because they did things that they didn't follow God's. Because they didn't follow what God asked of them. That's what I thought. Why they got killed. But because it, it talks about the carnal stuff they did and they weren't they weren't paying attention. That's why I'm a little confused. I have to be honest. That is I why thought, God wanted them killed, though. That is yeah. Why. But right. who gets? Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, Annie. Go ahead. Sorry, who gets to decide whether God said it or not? I mean, Ooh. we know that Moses did. Like the Crusades started because people said. God said the pagans need to die, which is kind of like the same thing here. And so they went and slaughtered all these people because they weren't, because they were pagan in, in, in the church's estimation. And so I think it's really hard stuff to deal with because you don't, uh, how do you know if that's God really directing that? I don't believe God directed the Holocaust. I don't believe that God directed Rwanda or anything like that. Right. So, yeah. You know, like back here, we know Moses was the prophet. We know Moses was being told what he was supposed to do. So you can say, okay, that should have happened. That's what is, that was what God wanted. But I think bringing it forward, how do you know what God wants, as opposed to like what evil people want. Because that's like a 9-11. Those people thought they were doing what God wanted them right. to do. Right, exactly. Who would like to continue to read? <laughs> Shall I continue to read? Because we're going sure, yeah. to we're gonna get into some numbers, and I'm going to go flying through the numbers because we got a lot to get through. Okay. okay, number 25. The Eternal One said to Moses, <laughs> You and Eleazar the priest and the family heads of the community, Take an inventory of the goods that were captured, human and beast, and divide the goods equally between the combatants who engage in the campaign and the rest of the community. You shall exact a levy for the eternal in the case of the warriors who engaged in the campaign. 
one item in 500 of persons, oxen, asses, and sheep shall be taken from their half share and give, given to Eleazar the priest as a contribution to the eternal. And from the half share of the other Israelites, you shall withhold one in every 50 human beings, as well as cattle, asses, and sheep, all the animals, and give them to the Levites who attend to the duties of the eternal's tabernacle. So Moses and Eleazar, the priest, it is the eternal commanded Moses, the amount of goods other than the spoil that the troops had plundered came to 60, 675,000 sheep. So there's a lot of sheep. animals and, and human beings, 32,000 human beings, namely females. Hello. Um, and thus, the half share of those who had engaged in the campaign, the number of sheep was 337, 337 Thousand. 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 I'm sorry. Five. I'm really yeah. good with numbers. Okay, <laughs> so we have all these other numbers. Yeah. The other half share of the Israelites, which Moses withdrew from the troops who had taken the field, that half share of the community consisted of 337,500 sheep and 36,000 head of cattle, 30,000 donkeys, 16,000 human beings. I can't right. imagine all these people and all these things. All right, so the commanders of the troops are, let me just conclude it with, from this half share of the Israelites, Moses withheld in every 50 humans and animals, and he gave them to the Levites who attended to the duties of the Eternal's tabernacle, as the Eternal had commanded Moses. So the commanders of the troop divisions, the officers of thousands and the officers of hundreds approached Moses. They said to Moses, your servants have made a check of the warriors in our charge and, do, and not one of us is missing. So we have brought us, brought as an offering to the eternal, such articles of gold as each of us came upon, armlets, bracelets, signet rings, earrings, and pendants, that expiation may be made for our persons before the eternal. Moses and Eleazar the priest accepted the gold from them, all kinds of wrought articles, all the gold that was offered by the officers of thousands and the officers of hundreds as a contribution to the eternal came to 16,750 shekels. But in the ranks, everyone kept his goods for himself. So Moses and Eleazar the priests accepted the gold from the officers of thousands and the officers of hundreds and brought it to the tent of meeting as a reminder in behalf of the Israelites before the eternal. So what do you think? They seem to be pretty honest, having the gold, bringing it to the temple and offering it to, to, to God. But also thinking, I'm thinking about like, it's also kind of a community, a communal offering as well to make sure everyone's lifted up in a way. Don't you think? What are they going to do with all this gold? I don't know. Yeah, see, no I- more I, weapons. I, <laughs> this this brings us to more materialism. <laughs> I just think it's we did, you know why do you have to give um like all these offerings of gold and silver and everything in front of for, for God because God doesn't need it. I don't understand it to be honest. I never understood that. Why do we have to get all this stuff? Well, I w I would say that it's a nice ritual to say like I'm not going to keep it for myself, but I'm going to give it to the eternal so that in case somebody else might need it, you know, maybe the priest oh, well, might have different. a... Okay, that's different. That's I mean, different. I'm just using my imagination at this point, but I'm assuming right. that because there's such a there's such a focus on, on doing things for God that I think yeah. that that's part of how they have that community. The, com the community right. was based around their ideas of, and beliefs of what God is and what God was, and I right. do believe they're trying really hard. But we still bring our donations and give our to God, you know, in different ways. Yeah. Right, to keep the, the temple going and everything else. Different right. things like that, yep. Yeah, yeah, but we have an economy that thrives on this. I mean, we can translate it into material things. You know, and if we have a person who's really dire needs, can donate money and the money can go to buying things to help that person. The thing is, what kind of exchange would they have had then and with whom? Well, I think that's probably where this comes from, where our modern uh, ideas of, of 
community and sharing and, and picking each other charity. up comes from, perhaps. Well, that makes me feel better than thinking that these guys that were in charge were taking in all the gold and living the life of luxury. I would prefer <laughs> to <laughs> I Taruma, love you, Taruma. Cynthia. I love you. You're so cool. <laughs> I'm not sure that life was a luxury at that time anyway. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. All right. Does anyone want to read from 32.1, The Reubenites and the Gadites? I'll read. All right, Amy. The Reubenites and the Gadites owned cattle in very great numbers, noting that the lands of Jarzer and Gilead were a region suitable for cattle. The Gadite, am I saying that right, and Reubenite leaders came to Moses, Eliezer the priest, and the chieftains of the community and said, Atora, Dibon, Jazer, Nimra, Heshbon, Eliala, Sabam, Nebo, and Bayon. Wow, nice. Very good. Wow. That the Eternal has conquered for the community of Israel is cattle country, and your servants have cattle. They're Texans. If this land were given to your servants as a holding, do not move us across the Jordan. Moses replied to the Gadites and the Reubenites, are your brothers to go to war while you stay here? Why will you turn the minds of the Israelites from crossing into the land that the Eternal has given them? That is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to survey the land. After going up to the Wadi Eskol and surveying the land, they turned the minds of the Israelites from invading the land that the Eternal had given them. Thereupon, the Eternal was incensed and swore. None of the men from 20,000... 20, I'm sorry, I, I, let, me, I, let me move it up to the top. None of the men. None of the men from 20 years up who came out of Egypt shall see the land that I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for they did not remain loyal to me. None except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Kenazite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they remained loyal to the Eternal. The Eternal, incensed at Israel, made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the whole generation that had provoked the Eternal's displeasure was gone. And now you, a breed of sinful men, have replaced your fathers to add still further to the eternal's wrath against Israel. If you go away from God, <laughs> who then abandons them once more in the wilderness, you will bring calamity upon all his people. Can we hold up for a second? I feel like we need to talk a little bit about this because this is, um, this of course goes back a couple of chapters when they, they first saw the land of Israel, they sent the spies in to check it out. And yeah. they came back and said, no way, it's full of giants, the area, they're going to kill yeah. us. And, and then, it was Caleb and J Joshua who said, it's great. They came out with grapes and they were dancing and they're like, come on, let's go. It's party time. Now, to me, this is so important because I was just thinking about this the other, the other day. It might have been in the shower. Who knows? But I was just thinking like, <laughs> what if the Israelites at, this, at that point in time, what if they did go into the land of Egypt? I mean, the land of Israel. What, what if they did go into the promised land at that first time? And then I was thinking... It would have been impossible either way because we would have never have gotten this lesson. It's all, all these things are really lessons. And I mean, these people suffered and they went through all these things. But if they went in that first time, we wouldn't have made it. You know, we, we wouldn't get the lesson, which was when God gives you a gift, take it and be joyful. <laughs> because we would or otherwise be banished for a few decades, maybe, maybe 40 years. I don't know. But okay. I thought it was really amazing. Okay, so Michael, if we bring it to what we have just read. Yes. This is a great example of a negotiation. Okay, so let's, let's, let's consider this for a minute. Okay. The two tribes okay, come to Moses and yep. say, you know, the lands east of the Jordan are very nice. They're very lush. Uh, we would like to have them. And then Moses says, he says, you know, if I give them to you, then nobody else is going to want to cross the Jordan. And remember what happened 40 years ago when we had the same situation. Mm -hmm. And now what we're going to read is the great comeback that the 
uh, the, the tribes of God and I forgot the other one, God and what was the name of the other one? Reubenites, the Reubenites. God, God and Reubenites came back with a fantastic um, negotiation that yeah. actually Moses accepted. So that's what we're going to read now. So this is a great example of a business negotiation. Great. Awesome. Annie, do you want to continue? Then they stepped up to him and said, we will build here sheepfolds for our flocks and towns for our children. And we will hasten as shock troops in the van of the Israelites until we have established them in their home, while our children stay in the fortified towns because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until the Israelites, every one of them, are in possession of their portion. But we will not have a share with them in the territory beyond the Jordan, for we have received our share on the east side of the Jordan. I so what so what they said was we are going to go we're going to give you our sons you know the ones that are of military age we're going to go with you conquer Canaan and then after we conquer Canaan then you give us the parts that we the lands that we want to on the east side of the Jordan excellent go ahead Annie Moses said to them, if you do this, if you go to battle as shock troops at the insistence of the eternal and every shock fighter among you crosses the Jordan at the insistence of the eternal until God has personally dispossessed the enemies and the land has been subdued at the insistence of the eternal and then you return, you shall be clear before the eternal and before Israel and this land shall be your holding under the eternal. But if you do not do so, you will have sinned against the eternal and know that your sin will overtake you. Build towns for your children and sheepfolds for your flock, but do <laughs> not do what you have promised. The Gadites and the Reubenites answered Moses, your servants will do as my Lord commands. Our children, our wives, our flocks, and all other livestock will stay behind in the towns of Gilead while your servants, all those recorded for war cross over at the insistence of the eternal to engage in battle as my Lord orders. All right, so to, to summarize that, what they said to him is, what, what, you know, the, the, the women, the older folks, and the children are going to remain in this land, but we're going to give you the military men. They're going to be the shock troops. In other words, we're going to be right up in front. And if we win, then this land becomes ours. That's great. And this, it also gives us another really great example of how Moses is, uh, he's such a great, like, he can figure things out, you know, he, he goes up to God too and says, don't kill these people. What will everyone say if you brought them out of Egypt? And, you know, he is, he's, he's the perfect leader in so many ways. There's so many good, there's so much we can learn from Moses. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. What else? What's interesting, though, all those years, um, you'd think that they would have learned that God follows through from what he, with what he promises. So they're, at that point, there really shouldn't even be hesitation. Yeah, but you know, you're thinking like you are today, but you have to understand these people had a slave mentality for 4,000 years. But at I that mean, point, they shouldn't have. No, they no, that's not crazy. true, because it, it takes years and years. They they had this they had a different type of mentality. They they didn't have the education you had and everything. It's a very different way. They 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 were doing things new that they've never done before, and everything was tested all the time for them. So I I can understand how they could they could want to you know kind of do devious things. I would I'm kind of like that type of person. I would try to find a shortcut. I know myself. No, so I I can actually. I can have compassion for those people and why they, they, you know, they didn't believe even after all these tests that they had, because it's hard when you're still, when you're still constantly getting challenged. I, I, I can understand that. They I were really still didn't. mentally in Egypt, you know, they were yeah, still, they were still to... mentally in Egypt. I really understand that. Yeah. yeah they didn't well, have to make yeah. any decisions or do anything back then. Mm -hmm. They, they didn't have the, the with it all that we have over generations of time. It's very hard for us to think of what it was like for them. 
Yeah. I know, and, and Cynthia always brings up that great fact that there's so many. I mean, to, to have that kind of, to have this crossing through the desert and to try to right. keep everyone and together with tens the Tens of thousands, tens of thousands, <laughs> yeah. right, yeah. Hundreds, hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands, yes. Does anyone so, want to continue or does anyone want, want to say anything? Myrna or? Well, I just keep thinking that by, by then, there should have been more of a, we follow God and God does right by us. I, yes. No, I, I just don't. think that mentality should be there by now. <laughs> okay, well, we can we can agree to disagree. That's all. <laughs> that ever, that Actually, ever, when you um, popular um, thing, God's time, not your time. You know, they 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 knew, probably knew or had faith that it was going to happen, but it it wasn't happening fast enough. So yeah. they lose their you know like, darn it. <laughs> and then they start grumbling and doing You know, a perfect example, actually a perfect example for Myrna is, Myrna, you know, you really have gone through some quite a few health challenges. And sometimes you said, I can't take this anymore, you know, and you think, well, gee, you know, you've gone through it enough to know that, well, it'll maybe get better or whatever. But it's hard when you're going through it. That's all I'm trying to give you the yeah. example of. I agree That's with all. you. I agree with you because I know I have said myself, Oh my God! This is going on and on and on too yeah, right. much, and it, it's right. really difficult. But getting back to this, I still think that there should have been a little more trust. Well, it's it's so funny because I feel I just, like uh, I, I'm like listening to your conversation, and I feel like this is a conversation I think every congregation has. Like yeah. and, you know, it's it's all so current today. It's like, why don't you trust God more? Let it, yeah. you know. I mean, because and we're in a world where we don't we trust the stock market more in a lot of ways. whatever you know. Like I mean, more you don't. I hope not. You know, but it's just it's like I mean it's like a, it's a modern thing. This is so modern. These these feelings of God trusting God and. It's great. It's fantastic. Um, does anyone want to continue on reading? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Mike. Then Moses gave instructions concerning them to Eliezer the priest, Joshua, son of Nun, and the family heads of the Israelite tribes. Moses said to them, If every shock fighter among the Gadites and the Reubenites crosses the Jordan with you to do battle at the instance of the Eternal, and the land is subdued before you, you shall give them the land of Gilead as a holding. But if you do not cross over with your shock troops, they shall receive holdings among you in the land of Canaan. So he came back and he says, okay, if you guys agree that your, your military men are gonna be the shock troops and, and you actually do this thing correctly, then you're gonna keep the land. But if you don't do it, the land is not yours. That, that was Moses' comeback. Again, this is negotiation. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Can you continue on? I think we're almost we're almost to the end. We got two more. Pair. Wait. Oh. Okay. And you know what Moses always said that he was famous for? He always said, "Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate." I think that's what he told them. I really don't remember him with having that accent, though. I, I remember. You know, I remember God saying that 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Gadites and the Rubenites said in reply, whatever the Eternal has spoken concerning your servants, we will do. We ourselves will cross over as shock troops at the instance of the Eternal into the land of Canaan, and we shall keep our hereditary holding across the Jordan. You're going? Yes, because this is the last paragraph of this. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> Moses assigned to them to the Gadites and Reubenites and the half tribe of Manasseh, son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the king and the kingdom of King Od of Bashan, the land with its various cities and the territories in the surrounding towns. The Gadites rebuilt Dibon, Ataroth, Aror, Atroth, Shofan, Jazer, Johebad, Beth Nimra, and Beth Haran as fortified towns or as enclosures for flocks. The Reubenites built Heshbon, uh, Ileale, 
a whole bunch. Some names being changed. Uh, they gave the wrong names to time. In other words, you know, they kept building. The descendants, Mahir, son of Benasse, went to Gilead and captured it, dispossessing the Amorites who were there. So Moses gave Gilead to Mahir, son of Benasse, and he settled there. Jair, son of Benasse, went and captured their villages, where he renamed Avot Jair. And Novoa went and captured Kenath and his, dependent, and his dependencies, renaming it Noba after himself. So, so everybody, everybody kept their word. Hey, by the way, do you, do you remember, uh, you know, what the, what the land was? Uh, you know, how they distributed uh, the land among the 12 tribes? It wasn't it by casting lots? No, 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 no. It had to do, number one, with how many people were in the, in the tribes. Hmm. Yeah. So the, the larger the number of tribes, uh, you know, the larger the number, the greater the, um, the amount of territory that they had. That there were three or four different things. They had nothing to do with casting lots. Really? Hmm. They, they no, you're thinking, you're thinking of another part in the Bible. Oh, okay. like, I, I don't know if we can do it, but uh, can you make me a host so I can share something with you? Uh, okay, let me see what I can do here. Yeah, let it depends him. what you it depends what you're sharing, Dr. Mike. No. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, hello. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the host of our show. <laughs> oh, oh, here it is. Hey. Oh. oh, there it is. Oh, got it. Now that's really cool. That is oh, I like cool. that, Mike. Thank you. That is a great that's a great illustration. Well I love it. I love it. Well, uh, uh, don't, don't say anything until we go through it, but if you take a look at it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I, I get a lot of it by the Reader's Digest version here. Yeah. Oh, okay, so here's a Jordan, right? Yeah. 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 It's the Dead Sea. Yeah. Yeah. When we crossed, we crossed right over here. Okay, right on top of the Dead Sea. Uh, but yeah. if you take a look, here's God and here's Reuben, the two tribes that we have been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And the big one is Manasseh. And Manasseh is a big one. Yeah. And Judah. Oh, it's a biggie. Yeah. Was also a biggie. Now, interestingly <laughs> enough, interestingly enough, because we couldn't do it, Moab was still there. Wow. Even, even, even though that's not a tribe. That's uh, great. Yeah, it's interesting because, but Ruth came from the Moab tribe. Well, yes, but re remember that she converted. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and through her, we ended up getting King David. I know. Oh. I didn't realize that the Philistines were that close to Judah. Okay, now the Philistines, uh, you know, which is now the Gaza Strip, yeah. right here. Yeah. Right. Gaza Strip, right here. Uh, Interesting. So they were next to Judah and below Dan. Hmm. Okay, say it again. Looking at this, they were below uh, Dan. Or Don, however you want to pronounce Don. it. Don, yeah. And beside um, Judah and Simeon, right there. Right. I mean, right smack dab against against Judah, really. Right. And and you remember that, uh, you know, once the 10 tribes disappeared, right. we ended up with Judah. Actually, we ended up with two, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, Those yeah. are the two that were left. Really? Now, here, here is a little biblical um, um, trivia question for you. If you count the number of tribes here, not Moab, there's 12. Right. That's what we had, the 12 But there tribes. were actually 13 tribes. Not Because well, the Levites? Bingo. Yeah, the Levites. Yeah, the Levites. And the reason why the Levites are not here is that the Levites didn't get land. Yes, that's so right. When we're oh, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so when, when we say the 12 tribes, we, we, what we mean is the 12 tribes who got land mm -hmm. and the 13, the Levites, had no land. That's why they, so there were actually 13 tribes. But can I ask you something? What about, the Kohen? The what about the Kohanes? What about the Kohanes? The Kohanes are part of uh, the Levites. Oh, they're part of the Levites. Okay. okay. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, question. I don't I'm, know if you I'm can answer it. I'm going to give it back to you, Mike. Oh, okay. I have a question of you. You know how, like when, what was it? Oh, uh, back then, it seems like you didn't, if you married outside of your tribe, you were intermarrying. And like when Ruth was uh, supposedly going back to the home, you know, her home to find somebody and marry there and she wouldn't leave Naomi. Yeah. But otherwise there have been other situations where the person was actually told to go and go to my tribe and find a, a woman for my son. I'm trying, who am I thinking of that? Um, Oh, Rebecca and, and thank you. I, right. Yeah, so what I was son. going to ask you, was there intermarriage among people of different tribes or did they always seem to stick to one of their own tribe? OK, like, my my opinion yeah. is that even though the Bible doesn't say that, but mm -hmm. obviously that was happening. Hmm. I think that what the Bible is trying to do is to say you must remain that, you know, as a unit, you must remain with unity because we believe in one God. We are monotheists and everybody else is a polytheist. So stay away from them because otherwise, you, you know, you're not going to be pure. So the Bible is saying that, but I am sure that there was all kinds of, of you know, us going to other tribes and other tribes coming over to us. I'm sure of that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so um, who was it? It was Manasseh and Ephraim. They split the tribe of Joseph, Joseph in two to make tw the 12, and Levi got the... Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, who would like to read uh, the, the marches? Masai. Anybody? I can do it. I will. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Myrna. Okay. These were the marches of the Israelites who started out from the land of Egypt troop by troop in the charge of Moses and Aaron. Moses recorded the starting points of their various marches as directed by the Eternal. Their marches by starting points were as follows. They set out from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. It was on the morrow of the Passover offering that the... Oopsie. Sorry, wait a minute. That the Israelites. Oh, Israel, I started out defiantly in plain view of all the Egyptians. The Egyptians, meanwhile, were burying those among them whom the Eternal had struck down. Every male firstborn, whereby the Eternal executed judgment on their gods. The Israelites set out from Ramses and encamped at Suk at Sukkot. Sukkoth? <laughs> yeah. They set out from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham, which is on the edge of the wilderness. They set out from Etham and turned about toward uh -huh, Pi Ha Ha Reroth, which faces Baal Zephon, and they encamped before Migdol. They set out from Pene Ha Ha Reroth and passed through the sea into the wilderness. And they made a three days journey in the wilderness of Etham and encamped at Mara. They set out from Mara and came to Elam. There were 12 springs in Elam and 70 palm trees. So they encamped there. They set out from Elam and encamped by the Sea of Reeds. They set out from the Sea of Reeds and encamped in the wilderness of Sin. They set out from the wilderness of sin and encamped at Dafka. They, <laughs> they set out, whoops, they set out from Dafka and encamped at Alish. They set out from Alish and encamped at Rephidim. It was there that the people had no water to drink. So they set out from Rephidim and encamped in the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from the wilderness of Sinai and encamped at Kibroth Atava. This is a bad GPS they have. <laughs> <laughs> they set out from Gilbroth at and encamped at Hazaroth. Then they set out from Hazaroth and encamped at Rithma. They set out from Rithma. We have to read the whole thing. They set out from Rimon Perez and encamped at Limda. 
They set out from Lindern and camped at Rissa. They oh. set out from Rissa and camped at Kahilath. They set out from Kahilath and encamped at Mount Shepherd. They set out from Mount Shepherd and encamped at Harada. They set out from Harada and encamped at Mekaloth. I'm sure there's some map that Dr. Mike has that can show all this <laughs> yeah, You know right where now? Where are you camped at Tahath? Come on. They set out from Tahath and encamped at Terra. They set out from Terra and encamped at Mithka. They set out from Mithka and encamped at <laughs> We have to read Tahath. this whole thing. <laughs> all right, let me see. All right, hold on. It took them time hold because on, you know on, how guys are. Men don't like to ask for directions, and men were in charge. Oh, my God. <laughs> Right. They didn't have a good GPS. Before yeah. you say anything, we get the picture that it was a lot of camping out. And then, <laughs> but what, what I, what the whole point is I, he did record it all. Very nice. I'm very proud of Moses. He's got a good diary. That's but I just, I just want to get to the end here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure there are probably maps that are that have spelled this out. Okay, so then they're on the, they set out from Kaddish and encamped at Mount Hor in the edge of the land of Edom. All right, who can pick it up at Aaron the priest? Because I think Murga was choking on the last encampment. <laughs> oh, come on. I, I, you know, this was getting a little silly. I mean, why, why do we have to read every Why, why can't we get to the end? I don't know. Right, right, we're at the end. We're at the end. We, we, okay. We, we, Michael, I have, I have a question for you. Okay. Okay. In here, it says Mount Hor. Why isn't it Mount Sinai? Um, that's a good question. That is a good question. I don't know the answer to it. I don't know. Because they, they did even... go to Sinai. Oh, Sinai is at the, where they get the Torah, right? Is yeah. that... Well, and, and, and this is Mount Hor, same thing. It's the same one. Okay. Okay. Yep. Is that another know. name for Mount Sinai then? Maybe it was another name for Sinai at that time. So we did say- they change it once they started living there? I was gonna say, does this mean they came full circle? Well, well, this is um, this okay. So they talk about Aaron the priest uh, having gone up to Mount Hor and then dying there, right? On the That's 40th right. year. So I don't know why. Do you, do you have the answer, Doctor Mike? I'm nope, interested. No, nope. no, you don't. <laughs> uh, it might not be an answer. Usually at this point in time, I take I take to the Google machine and I go. <laughs> where is my why is mount Hor not why is it here and i might just do that but you know what i'm gonna if i do that everyone's gonna go where what's that okay. like, we'll all do it afterwards yeah we'll yeah we'll, we'll figure it out later okay they were okay as far as i know um uh mount Hor is the same as mount nebo because they were on the eastern side of the um, of the Jordan River, yeah. we're all up top of Mount Nebo, looking over the promise the promised land into Canaan. I think that that's what it is. Oh. And that's where Moses died, right on Nebo. Uh, well, and 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 so did Aaron. Yeah, he was a, what, Aaron was 123 years old. Well, you know that that's another question for all of you guys. Do you really believe that these guys lived to 120 years? You I know, do. Tell you, yes. we're getting closer. <laughs> there were some people that had just died at 103, and then somebody at 108. Maybe that, now. Yeah. Well, no, it it goes back to what I was saying. They they get they had the best produce, the best wow. meats, and everything for God, and they were healthy people. These were like they weren't, they, they they weren't, weren't like, eating Twinkies or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and wait, they had a lot of exercise and walking. Yes, <laughs> yes, and no GMOs. Everything was organic. There wasn't any pesticides. It was it was. They were living the high life. They didn't even know. Well, obviously, <laughs> obviously, I'm not going to make it because they're going up a route one i stopped at every restaurant <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so leave me out oh my gosh gary could we uh you want to pick it up gary at the where at, are we number 38 38, oh, yeah, 38. Aaron, the priest. aaron the priest ascended mount hor at, at the command of the eternal and died there in the 40th year after the israelites had left the land of egypt on the first day of the fifth month Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. And the Canaanite, king of Arad, who dwelt in the Negev, in the land of Canaan, learning of the coming of the Israelites, learned of the coming of the Israelites. They set out from Mount Hor and encamped at Zelmor. They went from Zelmor, they set out from, 
et cetera, et cetera. They were setting out and camping, setting out and camping. <laughs> thank you. Thank all you. these different places, all, all right. over the place. Oh, man, they did so much setting out and so much camping. Do you want to take it from 50? Uh, all right. Okay, by the way, Michael, I have just uh, asked Rabbi Google. <laughs> Rabbi Google, yeah. And Rabbi Google says Mount Hor is the name given in the Old Testament to two distinct mountains. One borders the land of Edom in the area south of the Dead Sea, and the other one is by the Mediterranean Sea at the northern border of the land of Israel. Bingo. Okay. Bingo. Very good. Excellent. Very nice. So, are we still out in the campments? Uh, yes, so we're I, never going to get out of there. <laughs> well, I think we're. I think we're kind of. We've come to this the end because this is where. Okay, why don't I do the? Um, anyone? Uh, let me let me start this one. Uh, in the steps of Moab at the Jordan near Jericho, the Eternal One spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan." You shall dispossess all the inhabitants of the land. You shall destroy all their figured objects. You shall destroy all their molten images. And you shall demolish all their cult places. And you shall take possession of the land and settle in it. For I have assigned the land for you to possess. You shall apportion the land among yourselves by lot, clan by clan. With larger groups, increase the share. With smaller groups, reduce the share. Wherever the lot falls for it, that shall be its location. You shall have your portions according to your ancestral tribes. But if you do not dispossess the inhabitants of the land, those whom you allow to remain shall be stings in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall harass you in the land in which you live, so that I will do to you what I plan to do to them. Ooh. Yikes. Whoa. Yikes. <laughs> All right. Anyone want to care to pick it up at 34 <laughs> to 1? First one. I'll read it. 31, 34, 1. Yes. Okay. The Eternal One spoke to Moses saying, instruct. Wait, I can make this a little bigger because I can't read it. Okay. Instruct the Israelite people and say to them, when you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as your portion. The land of Canaan with its various boundaries. Your southern sector shall extend from the wilderness of Zin alongside Edom. Your southern boundary shall start on the east from the tip of the Dead Sea. Your boundary shall then turn to pass south um, to the ascent of Akrabim and continue to Zin. And its limits shall be south of Kadesh, Berea, reaching Hazar Adar and continuing to Asmon. From Asmon, the boundary shall turn toward the wadi of Egypt and terminate at the sea. For the western boundary, you shall have the coast of the great sea that shall serve as your western boundary. Is the great sea the Mediterranean? I think okay. you're right on, yes. I think it is, okay. Yeah, All right. Okay, from the great sea um, to Mount Hor. From Mount Hor, draw a line to Lebo Hamath and let the boundary reach Zadad. The boundary shall then run to Zephon and terminate at Mazar Inan. Then shall, and th that shall be your northern boundary. For your eastern boundary, you shall draw a line from Hazar Iman to Shepam. From Shepam, the boundary shall uh, descend to Rebla on the east side of Ain. From there, the boundary shall continue downward and about on the eastern slopes of the Sea of Chinnereth. The boundary shall then descend along the Jordan and terminate at the Dead Sea. At that point, I was jumped in. <laughs> 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 I'm just to hell with this. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I'm really losing it. Um, <laughs> where am I? I can't read anymore. Um, oh, that shall be, I can't, I got to make this bigger all of a sudden. Oh, God. Um, that shall be your land as defined by its boundaries on all sides. Yes. Moses is okay, let's just get to the end. All right, here we go. <laughs> right. Moses, uh, where am I? Moses instructed the Israelites saying, this is the land you are to receive by lot as your 
hereditary portion, which the journal has commanded to be given to the nine and a half tribes. That's where you got the idea of the lot might, yeah. right there. That's where you got the idea. For the Reubenite tribe by its ancestral houses, the Gateite tribe by its ancestral houses, and the half tribe of Manasseh have already received their portions. Those two and a half tribes have received their portions across the Jordan, opposite Jericho in the east, the Orient side. The eternal one spoke to Moses saying, these are the names of the commission, commissioners through whom the land shall be apportioned for you, Eleazar the priest and Joshua son of Nun. And you shall also take a chieftain from each tribe th through whom the land shall be apportioned. These right, are the names of... These are a lot okay. of names. These are all the... Yeah, let, look, so we all know all names. these guys. Okay, yeah, they're please. very good, okay, very good. Very good. And now the yeah. eternal one spoke to Moses in the steps of Moab at the Jordan near Jericho saying, instruct the Israeli people to assign out of the holdings apportioned to them, towns for the Levites to dwell in, and you shall assign to the Levites pasture land around their towns. The town shall be theirs to dwell in, and the pasture shall be for the cattle they own and all of their beasts. The town pasture that you are to assign to the Levites shall extend a thousand cubits outside the town wall all around. You shall measure off 2,000 cubits outside of that, 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 all these cubits and crap. Okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> but that's interesting, uh, isn't it? That That's what Dr. Yeah. Mike was talking about. The, the yeah. Levites <laughs> The Levites only got these little towns to live in. They didn't have these big, big right. portions. So they, they, had yes. their, they still had their little, um, their little thing. And, but they had their pasture land, so they had it for the right. animals. Right. Um, and so it goes on and on. Now, so let's see. The eternal one, let's go to nine. The eternal right. one spoke further to Moses. Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, you shall provide yourself with places to serve you as cities of refuge to which a meal killer who has slain a person unintentionally may flee. See, that's that's what they're talking about, murder, between murder and, and um, killing somebody. It's, it wasn't, he didn't mean to do it. The city shall serve you as a refuge from the avenger so that the killer, oh goodness, I'm sorry, what happened is somebody's trying to call me and my phone just... <laughs> <laughs> called it out. I, I, I'm not okay. going to answer it, but I, I don't know. Okay, let me see if it comes back. Let me see if it comes back. Hold on a minute. There you go. Okay. Oh, I got it. So I'm back. Okay. Uh, where am I now? I Number lost 12. The city. Number 12. Okay. The city shall serve you as a refuge from the avenger so that the killer may not die unless he has stood trial before the assembly. The towns that you thus assign shall be six cities of refuge in all. These cities shall be designated beyond the Jordan and the other three shall be designated in the land of Canaan. They shall serve as cities of refuge. These six cities shall serve the Israelites and the resident aliens among them. Oh, who are the aliens? <laughs> no, the I'm strangers. Serious. The strangers. Okay, oh, the strangers. Oh, okay, the strangers. Okay, so that any man who slays a person unintentionally may flee there. Anyone, however, who strikes another with an iron object so that death results in a, is a murderer. The murderer must be put to death. So even if by accident you hit somebody with an iron object, you're now a murderer. Okay, if one struck another with a stone tool that could cause death and death resulted, that person's a murderer. Okay, similarly, if one struck another with a wooden tool that could cause death and death resulted, that mur that person's a murderer. Okay, so we're seeing all the reasons you can be a murderer. Right. Okay, then, all right. And it goes to what Gary was saying about intent. I mean, if you pick up a yeah. shoe to hit somebody with it, what's the intent, right? Or Right, right, right. All right, so let's go down. Yourself. What's what? that? What if you were trying to protect yourself? That's self right. Self-defense. Self-defense. I, self I don't defense. know if they got to that part, but. No, they do. There, There is something I remember reading in the There is Torah. somewhere in the Torah where it says there if somebody is comes in into your house. There is somewhere in the Torah that if you are, if you are being, yeah, attacked, if, if, if it's self-defense, it's not murder. It's, it's If somebody else. comes into your dwelling, yeah. like it's not supposed to. Oh. You have the right. That's self defense. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. so I don't remember where, but I okay, read it. So it says if a man pushes without malice a forethought or hurls any object at the victim unintentionally or inadvertently dropped upon the victim any deadly object of stone and death resulted, though not being an enemy and not seeking to harm, in such cases the assembly shall decide between the slayer and the blood avenger. The assembly shall protect the killer from the blood avenger and the assembly shall restore him to the city of refuge to which he fled, and there he shall remain until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the sacred oil. But if the killer ever goes outside the limits of the city of refuge to which he has fled, 
and the blood of Edra comes. Please go up. Thank you. Where am I? Uh, blood of Edra comes upon him uh, outside the limits of the city, and the blood of Edra kills the killer. There is no blood guilt on his account, for he must remain inside his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. After the death of the high priest, the killer may return to his his land holding. Boy, that's a long time. What if the yeah. guy lives a long time? So such shall be. What if he doesn't, of... though? If he doesn't, then you're off. The, you're yeah, off. You're right. right. You're off the hook. It could go yeah. either way. You know? yeah. Can we talk such... about this a little bit? Because there's a lot. There's a lot okay. here to talk about. And um, as Gary was saying, there's so many different variables, right? There's variables. But the big thing for me that I really get out of this is that they they were really trying to set up some system of law and order. Um, and, it, and, it, and it probably is the basis and foundation for all the laws that we have now. Um, and I'm just going to point out one thing that a lot of people, you know, think, oh, well, if we didn't have all these laws and everything, well, the, do you know, do you, did you hear about the chop that place in Seattle, which was off the, they, they took it as part of the city. It was like a protest zone where yeah. there was no police and everything. Well, they broke it up recently about a week or two ago. And one of the things things that people said is it started to be like the people that were in there explained that it became like a militant cult where there was no rules people were getting killed in there they couldn't get the ambulances in there so this kind of when when we're reading this these these rules it's so important to try to keep society in a, in a, in a place where everyone can kind of say okay and and you can even you can even see in here they they talk about an assembly where an assembly comes in and, and almost like a jury and needs to decide okay well what was uh, the intent there and what was the intent there right. so you can really see these things starting to form and it's it's really important I mean it's, it's I mean as as much as it it's you know it can be like well you know the high priest died so <laughs> you're off after two weeks and it that. also you also read later too that you can't. Um... Like in other words, it has to be more than one witness to determine that somebody did ah. something with malice. As a matter you of fact, just... Gary, right. on, yep. on thirty, you're actually going to see part of it. Oh, if you I, want to read it, Gary? Yeah. Yeah. If anyone says a person, they kill him, oh, yeah. they execute it only right. on the evidence of witnesses. But the yeah. testimony of a single witness against a person shall not suffice for a sentence of death. So you got to have more than one for a death sentence. Perfect, wow. Do you wanna continue on there, Gary, at number 31? I'm just gonna bring it okay. all the way to the top. Yep. Okay. You may not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of a capital crime. A murderer must be put to death. Nor may you accept ransom in lieu of flight to a city of refuge, enabling a man to return to live on his land before the death of the priest. You shall not pollute the land of which you live, for blood pollutes the land and the land can have no expiation for blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in which I myself abide, for I the eternal abide among the Israelite people. The family heads in the clan of the descendants of Gilead, son of Machia, son of Menasheh, one of the Josephite clans came forward and appealed to Moses and the chieftains, family heads of the Israelites, they said, The Eternal commanded my Lord to assign the land to the Israelites as shares by lot. And my Lord was further commanded by the Eternal to assign the share of our kinsman Zelophehad to his daughters. Now, if they marry persons from another Israelite tribe, their share will be cut off from our ancestral portion and be added to the portion of the tribe into which they marry. Thus, our allotted portion will be dis diminished. And even when the Israelites observe the Jubilee, their share will be added to that of the tribe into which they marry, and their share will be cut off from the ancestral portion of our tribe. Well, this is a good reason for not doing that, not marrying somebody from another tribe, because you have to take your land, your portion of the land with you, and it leaves these other people without it. I thought, but Myrna, what they're talking about in here, remember the story about the five daughters, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the, from the man who didn't have sons, yeah. and to Moses, and they said, you know, this, this is not right, that we should be uh, able to get land, uh, even though my, our father had no sons, 
what, uh, what they're talking about in here is this. If we give the land to the five daughters, mm -hmm. when they get married, their husbands are now going to inherit that portion of the land. So essentially what they said is, the way to get around this thing is that these five daughters can only marry men from the same tribe. Therefore, they don't lose anything. Interesting. Mm. Now, that's what this that might go. Okay. <laughs> I don't hey, know why. Why? Why do you guys have me here? You know. <laughs> I would toss and turn all night long trying to figure that out. So thank you. Okay, that's what it is. Excellent. Who, who wants to continue? Dr. Mike, do you want to finish it off? Because we're right down toward almost the end. Okay, the daughters of, you know, that guy did as the eternal had completed. Okay? Um, and they were married to sons of their uncle. So, you know, they, they have to remain in the same tribe. Okay, marrying into clans of descendants of Benasseh, son of Joseph, that's where they came from. And so their share remained in the tribe of their father's clan. Got it? There we go. Yes. Okay. These are the commandments and regulations that the eternal enjoined upon the Israelites through Moses on the steps of Moab at the Jordan near Jericho. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. I can almost see Charlton Heston right now. <laughs> Gary, we need music at this point. All right, everyone mute. Everyone has to mute now. Yeah, mute but sing along though. You know, while you're muted, I'll hear you. And you'll hear yourself. Okay. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad 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 Beautiful, Gary. Wonderful. 